Joining us right now, Jay Jaffe, who is enjoying his uh, staycation from his home right now in uh, Brooklyn, New York. And Jay uh, joins us every Wednesday to talk a little baseball and beer. All right, you tell me, how's the uh, staycation uh, for you been so far? Jay, what are the highlights? Um, you know, it, I think the, the, the biggest highlight has been uh, uh, a little bit of sleeping in, but it hasn't been much of a staycation. I mean, you know, between watching an attempted coup and then writing 5,000 words on Tommy Lasorda, mm -hmm. um, you know, I've actually had my hands full and, and much of my time here has been spent uh, last three days shepherding my daughter through uh, uh, remote classes here, uh, uh, you know, for her, for her, for preschool. So it's, uh, um, this is, this is not a particularly relaxing uh, time. Um, but it was sort of a necessity. My wife and I both had some time off coming and we divided up these two weeks at uh, my daughter's home uh, to, to try to help uh, get through it. Well, good for you. And I want to ask you about uh, Tommy because uh, we did a show last week and had an opportunity to talk to Carl Erskine, who's 94 years oh, wow. old. Um, and he joined us and shared stories about Tommy from uh, their playing days together in Brooklyn to... Uh, obviously, all the years that uh, he has spent uh, with the club uh, as a coach and manager. And I mean, you think about it and really, you know, Tommy Lasorda would be just a normal player that had a cup of coffee in the big leagues for a couple of seasons. Had he not come back and, and worked his way through the organization as a scout, a coach and later on a manager that won two World Series titles and, and goes to Cooperstown. Yeah, I mean, he had remarkable staying power. He, you know, he had been... Uh... Uh, drafted uh, and developed by the by the Phillies, came to the Dodgers in I think 1949, uh, late 48, um, and then back to them in 57 after after uh, uh, leaving them in 55, um, and had been continuously employed by the team in since 1957 as a as a pitcher, a scout, uh, a, you know a, a a minor league manager. Uh, and, you know, and, and then a third base coach and just really, you know, an unparalleled career, um, you know, in terms of length and, and, and the variety of hats and the fact that he, you know, he oversaw uh, in the minors so many of the players that were the keys for him um, when he first got to the Dodgers. Um, and he was just this larger than life presence, presence, in, you know, in, in baseball, for which they're really among managers, there isn't much of a parallel. I mean, and, you know, cause he, he was, he was a celebrity pitch man. He was on TV everywhere. Um, you know, and, and, uh, I don't know, thinking back, that was, you know, I got into baseball in the late seventies, right. When he was starting his tenure as, as, uh, as manager. And, you know, I guess you wonder like, why weren't all managers like this? I mean, he was a salesman for baseball. Yeah. You know, and, and I think that that like more than anything else, I think that's that to me, that's his biggest legacy is that he sold baseball to people and, you know, help and, and made them love it. Well, I think you're wearing a Brooklyn Dodgers cap, if I'm not mistaken. And yeah. yep. And um, one of the interesting things about Lasorda in 54 and 55, when he was trying to break in with the Dodgers as a, a lefty pitcher, was just how rock solid that starting rotation was. I mean, you're going to have a really difficult time getting a spot. And, and obviously, in, in June of 55, look who bumps him out. They, they dropped him down to Montreal to make room for Sandy Koufax. And in those days, Koufax was just a, a hard-throwing 20-year-old uh, who hadn't really found himself until uh, years later when he ends up in Los Angeles with the Dodgers. Yeah, I mean, Koufax, you know, both Koufax and Lasorda struggled with their control. Um, you know, they, they, uh, uh, they, they had trouble finding the plate. They had trouble, you know, with, with uh, uh, hitting batters and things like that. But the thing was, is that Koufax got the real money. He was a bonus baby, which meant that, that, that the uh, Dodgers had to keep him on their big league roster for two years uh, or risk losing him via waivers when they tried to send him down to the minors. So it really was no, just, you know, Lasorda always said they made the wrong decision, and, and uh, um, but it was really no decision at all. I mean, if you're a general manager, you want to keep both players in the organization first and foremost, you know, so you, you keep up the one you've got to keep up and you send down the one you got to send down. And, you know, with pitching, I mean, more so nowadays than then. Pitchers get hurt all the time. You figure, yeah. you know, you're going to need this guy at some point. Only, you know, for Lasorda, the problem was is those guys didn't get hurt very much. And, you know, he had very few opportunities. And when he did, you know, he, they didn't pan out.
Exactly. And, and again, you, not only did you have a young Koufax in 55, but you also had uh, a young Don Drysdale who was just starting to work his way up to the big leagues as well. And you think about just those two young arms and then all the veteran arms that they had, guys like, uh, you know, Preacher Rowe and Carl Erskine and, uh, you know, Joe Black for a couple of years early in the, in the 50s and then moves into the bullpen and, and just how deep they were. And you realize this is a World Series team in 55, but they played the Yankees and in 52 and 53. And then also uh, the, you know, they're just, it was, a, it was a team that was used to winning and used to going into the world series. They just, they didn't get a chance to break through very much. Yeah. You know, they didn't, they didn't have much space for projects. Um, and they, you know, uh, Johnny Padres, another, another mm -hmm. young pitcher who was uh, the hero of the 55 series there uh, pitching that game seven. So the brought, brought home that, that championship. Um you know, the, the problem for Lasorda is then, you know, he got he wound up with the Kansas City A's who were bad ball club and he got snot knocked out of him there. Uh, so it, it ha didn't really bolster his case that he belonged in the major leagues. I was just writing, you know, I have one of my earliest memories of Lasorda um, is during the 1978 National League Championship Series against the Phillies. He comes to the mound and makes a pitching change and they throw up his stats on the his, his stats as a pitcher on the screen. Owen four six forty eight ERA. I mean, that's a that's a tough legacy to to have to haul around uh, um, and have uh, shown on a national broadcast. You know, the funny thing is, though, back in those days, that's all he was known for, really. And people didn't really know the name. They didn't know, like, you know, he was a triple A manager. But, you know, you think about all these years later and obviously, uh, you know, he's iconic and, and someone that you know, he retires in 96. But really, right up until his death, there's, there's video of him getting champagne doused on him at the age of like 91 when the Dodgers were back in the World Series in 2018. Yeah. Um, you know, he actually did have a level of celebrity that was that was unequaled to any other coach. By the time he, he you know, he took the Dodgers manager, he, you know, he, Frank Sinatra had already promised to sing the national anthem at his opening day. He was already pals with like Sinatra and Don Rickles and some of those guys. And there's a famous, I've never actually um, found the clip online. I don't think it exists online, but uh, he was mic'd up as a third base coach for the game of the week uh, in 74 when Ron Say hit a home run and he, he basically predicted it. Um, and uh, that, things like that gave him a level of celebrity that no other coach had. So he comes to the Dodgers and he's, you know, when he's managing, I mean, he's already, He's, you know, he's not a household name, but he's more he's got a higher Q rating than any coach in the, in, in the country uh, coming into that job. But yeah, right. I mean, yeah, still around in in in, uh, in 2018. His last public appearance was actually uh, at game six of, of the 2020 World Series when the Dodgers clinched it for the first time since since he left. So um, I didn't see any shots of him in the in the uh, um, uh, in the in, in the in the clubhouse of that one, obviously, because there was no clubhouse this year. Um and there was mass chaos uh, after the uh, uh, after the World Series because of Justin Turner. But uh, I imagine he was pretty happy about that. One last thing on Lasorda before we break and, and come back and talk about uh, Liam Hendricks, big deal, and some of the other things going on. Where do you have him amongst the great managers of all time when you really start to, to put him up there against the best? Uh, does, Las does Lasorda have a case to be in that conversation? Well, you know, I mean, I think he's got some case, but I think that, I mean, he's not McGraw. He's not Earl Weaver. He was not like a master tactician. Uh, it was not Tony La Russa, but he could, you know, he was probably the best emotional leader I've seen uh, in terms of, you know, in terms of baseball, like a style that we just don't see uh, as much uh, anymore. You know, maybe, maybe Billy Martin had some of that, but Billy Martin, you know, his players hated him. Uh, at, pretty quickly uh, because he was such an asshole. Um, well, sort of, I mean, he was, you know, I think uh, could be, could be accused of that as well, but uh, um, not, not quite to the same, to the same degree. Um, you know, he got, he got everybody pulling together and, and, and wanted to win for him because he, you know, that was, that was who he was. So I think, you know, he's, he's maybe a top 10, top 20 manager. I don't, it's tough to, it's tough to put him too high in, in, in there, you know, other guys had higher winning percentages, more wins, more stylistic innovations. But um, in terms of my lifetime, it's certainly a pretty impressive run. No doubt. All right. More with Jay as we keep things moving here on Sports Talk. But as we hit the bottom of the hour, let's go over to Adrian. He's standing by and has a Sports Center update for us.
Continuing our conversation right now with Jay Jaffe from Fangraphs.com, and uh, we'll get his beer pick of the bee, uh, beer pick of the week in a little bit. Uh, Jay, let's talk about one of the big deals that uh, has happened since we last spoke, and that's Liam Hendricks getting signed to the White Sox. And uh, what a deal it was! I mean, you know, you're talking about three years and 54 million guaranteed, which is an enormous deal for a closer. And you know what? I, I like Hendricks a lot. He's got great stuff. He's in the prime of his career. Teams aren't used to spending this kind of money for a closer, especially the White Sox, which is why it kind of caught a lot of us uh, by surprise a little bit. Yeah, it's a it's it's um it, it's a big outlay, and and uh, um you know I I think uh, uh, the history of of reliever contracts that large is is not particularly a happy one. I mean, the Wade Davis deal with the Rockies comes comes to mind. I mean, for everybody besides Mariano Rivera, these deals uh, uh, generally don't pan out, but you know, the White Sox, I mean, they've, they're, you know, they're really going, you know, they've really gone all in here. Um, and I think that uh, uh, building out that bullpen was part of their to-do list and Hendricks is clear, clearly the best reliever on the market. Uh, came up very big for the A's the last couple of years. Uh, just, just dominant. I'm surprised that, um, you know, because right now the best closer outside of Hendricks is probably Brad Hand. I still can't get over the fact that every team in baseball passed on Hand for that $10 million club option when Cleveland, uh, when Cleveland waived him. Yeah, it, it, the, uh, the extent, to, the, the, you know, the extent to which that's, uh, sorry about this. No, that's okay. Thank you. Um, yeah, it's, it's uh, uh, just – you know, kind of mystifying, but I think a lot of it just has to do, and I don't want to, you know, I don't want to be apologist for the owners because I think that they're, you know, they're playing, they're playing this in a way that, that, that annoys me. Um, but there's so much uncertainty about when the season's going to start and what, what, what it's going to look like. It's going to be a full season. Um, are there going to be fans? Uh, things like that, that uh, maybe committing $10 million in November was, you know, to a reliever, uh, was maybe a little bit a little bit uh, tough to swallow, but that said, you know, yes, he was the best reliever on the market, you know, or, or one of the best relievers on the market, and kind of a no-brainer. You're not going to get him uh, for, you know, you're not going to get much a better much of a better deal than that, especially when you think about the fact that you know there are no bad one-year deals. I mean, you know, the worst thing you could say about a one-year deal is you know, that, that you know that year's a mess. You don't have a long-term commitment. If Liam Hendricks blows out his elbow, you've still got you know. Th uh, three years on that deal that you've got it, you know, you've got to hope that he, that he rebounds. Absolutely. Right. Now, um, you know, you talk about that trade and then clearly the uh, Francisco Lindor deal with the Mets, a monster. And now the Mets are already saying they want to keep Lindor long-term. I, I would have thought that'd be a no brainer, Jay. You're not going to give up uh, the kind of collateral and basically your entire middle infield in Jimenez and Rosario to just have a one year rental. Plus Steve Cohen has already said he wants to bring in the best and, and, and assuming pay the best, unlike the Wilpons. So uh, this deal is a big one for the Mets. Um, you still think that uh, Springer could come around and, or maybe they go a different route. And uh, I can't remember if you had brought up Jackie Bradley last week for us yeah. during the show, but uh, again, uh, it's a it's a huge one, and you kind of wonder: Will we see anything else as big as this between the, now and the start of the season? Well, I, you know, I think we're going to see. You know, Springer's going to spring. I think Springer's probably getting pretty close. I've heard that the Marcel Ozuna's market's working. You know, we're going to see some big deals coming down the pike here. I, I was writing up something on DJ LeMahieu for Friday, uh, my first non Hall of Fame piece in a long time. Um, aside from these, uh, these uh, obituaries, which I guess count as Hall of Famers too. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, all, the only one of the top 10 uh, uh, free agents in the, in the fan graphs uh, top 50 who signed is, is, the, is the KBO infielder, uh, you know, who's, who signed with the Padres. And, and, you know, so everybody's in the same boat. They're all waiting for the market to move. The number 11 on that list is Marcus Stroman, who, you know, who accepted a qualifying offer. So, you know, there's nothing going on out there. And it's not like, um, you know, the, the, you know, one guy's market has, has dried up. Um, 
you know, it's just a, a full freeze. And I think a lot of it just has to do with all that uncertainty I mentioned. With the news that baseball is looking to have fans back uh, potentially and maybe reduce capacity for spring training games and then during the regular season, what kind of an effect do you think that will have on negotiating the 2021 season, which right now is still up in the air because baseball hasn't given the players yet really a concrete example of what they want? Yeah, it's a. I, I wish I knew. I mean, I think trying to predict right now is is tough. So much of it depends on what happens here in the next couple of months uh, with a new administration coming in and 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 reduce. You know, we've got four thousand deaths a day from from COVID uh, right now. Just astronomical, appalling numbers. Uh, they got to get that under control. I really don't think they should be thinking about fans in spring training. I, uh, Arizona, especially, is a place where 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 you know positive rates are high. Um, it just seems like bad news to, 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 to do it. You know, it, we'll see, I think it needs to be handled on a case by case basis, uh, you know, in the, in the various uh, uh, cities and ballparks, but I, I'm, you know, I, I know this is good. This is going to hurt the sport if they don't, if they don't get the revenue, but uh, at the same time, you know, fan safety has to come first. Player safety has to come first. Um, you know, I don't want to see them rush into something and, and, uh, uh, I am concerned about uh, this, you know, this this effort because if they do think they're playing a full season under normal conditions, uh, that's that's not that's not going to happen. I hear you. Well, we'll have to wait and see when things do develop, how it's going to go down. What do you have coming up for us on Fangraphs when you get uh, out of the unofficial staycation, since it's not really an yeah. official staycation? Right. Um, I, like I said, I'm working on something. On, it's, it's on DJ LeMahieu and on you know, how the various teams that are pursuing him, how they would fit him into the lineup. Some of them have vacancies at third base. Some of them have vacancies at second base. Um, some of them are pursuing other big name free agents. So just kind of try, trying to trying to uh, uh, read the rosters and see how, you know, how they would work it. Um, and then next week I'll probably do something on, um, on the hall of fame voting and, and sort of what the, uh, uh, what the numbers are telling us uh, uh, and, you know, sp specifically a lot of like, um, you know, the big jumps in voting, like what, uh, um, you know, what, what we can expect to see is, you know, is this guy close enough to get in? Um, so it'd be something, something along those lines and hopefully some more baseball news. I'm hopeful that we get a transaction or two here. Um, I've also got uh, uh, a couple other things on the back burner. One, one about pitching in my jaws system, but the, not sure that's going to be ready for prime time next week. Well, how about uh, beer? Let's wrap it up with your beer pick of the week. I'm looking forward to seeing what you're going to talk about this week, Jay. All right. I can't remember whether I've talked about this one before. I suspect I might have, but uh, this is from Torch and Crown, uh, same brewery I talked about last week. This is another beer that I got in, in that batch. It's their Tenement Pilsner. It's one of the best craft Pilsners I've had. Uh, it's 4.9% ABV. It's got a nice initial sweetness when 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 you uh, when you tuck into it, uh, but just really classic uh, pilsner taste, crisp, um, refreshing. I you know I, I'm I, as we said last week. You know I'm liking these lower alcohol level beers because I don't get the headaches as as, as often. And and this one is uh, uh, it's great. It's a great accompaniment to food. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, I wish I could get it more easily. I can get it delivered, but I'm not seeing it yet on the on the uh, the shelves in uh, in the craft stores and uh, or the grocery stores as opposed to some of the other ones. But uh, I do like it a lot. Good review. Good way to wrap us up, Jay. Always great seeing you, and look forward to doing it again with you here uh, next week. All right, sounds great, Steve. Jeff Erickson, our weekly fantasy guest, where we talk uh, about all the uh, news, whether it's uh, football, baseball, or in this case, basketball. Good to have you back, Jeff. And I noticed on the front page of uh, rotowire.com, you've already uh, put up the instant reaction uh, to the uh, James Harden trade from earlier today. Yeah, I mean, that was a wild deal. So uh, Nick Whalen and Alex Barutha do a lot of our, uh, our, our run our hoops coverage. They are the main guys and do that. And uh, yeah, you know, it was, it was wild. I mean, we had a big news in, in the political world and big news in the sports world right at the same time. Um, and seeing those intersect with each other on my timeline was pretty wild. It is a pretty wild. And, and really, that was the uh, Woj bomb that so many were waiting for when it just came down. And as we've talked about, I'll, I'll get your thoughts on this, even though I know for you, uh, you know, football and baseball are, are the big ones and, and you follow every sport through Rotowire. But 
is this trade just bad for, for sports in the NBA? Because again, it just shows that super teams are able to not just continue to form like they are, but you know, we see players that are essentially holding their, their clubs hostage saying, Hey, uh, you know what? I'm done. If you're not going to trade me, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be checked out for a while. And all of a sudden players lose their value because as a result, you know, you, you're, you're another team. You realize that uh, James Harden right now probably wouldn't get you nearly as much as James Harden a, a year ago, just because of the situation changing and how disgruntled he's become. So you don't see a lot of other sports to some extent, maybe the NFL, but Nobody else really has this kind of influence on teams where we see in the NBA. I mean, the thing I, the thing I ha don't like is, you know, Harden so signed that contract willingly. It wasn't like he was drafted and by the Rockets and stuck there or anything like that. He had a real shot at free agency. He, he opted not to take it, you know, and, you know, say what you will. I mean, the fact is he was, he was under contract with the Rockets. I don't like what he did with them you know, showing up at the camp out of shape, showing up late, all that sort of stuff. I, I don't care for that. Other than that, I mean, I don't mind players being empowered. I don't mind players having the power because I think in a lot of cases uh, that that's, it, hell, it, it, you know, look at baseball, look at the Chris Bryant situation with the Cubs where they manip manipulated his service time to get that extra year out of him, which costs him, you know, tens of millions of dollars, not to mention just that extra year and years matter. I mean, we, we've seen a lot of times now in baseball, look, baseball isn't signing any free agents hardly. We saw finally had Liam Hendricks, so it might, you know, open up the dam a little bit there, but all the top free agents remain unsigned in baseball. And they're, they're, baseball is systematically going through a sequence here where players are, uh, you know, not seeing that payday when it gets to free agency that they might have gotten in the past. And maybe that's, that's smart. Maybe that's analytically smart, but it's unfair because their wages are suppressed at the beginning part of their schedule. So is it great the way he handled it? No. Do I mind players having more power? No. Okay. Now, as far as, uh, you know, you mentioned baseball and, and what's happening. We could see Bryant uh, traded uh, before long. It's very possible that that, mm -hmm. that that does happen. And, you know, you wonder uh, good destinations, where he ends up. I've heard rumblings of possibly the Texas Rangers. Um, are there other teams you've heard that, that have been seriously interested right now in Bryant services? I haven't heard too much about him, no. Uh, you know, these things, they take, they, they happen quickly now, like the Lindor, Francisco Lindor, we knew he was going to get traded. Right. But, you know, specifically the Mets, we didn't hear too many like direct rumors. And then the whole thing happened in the course of an hour after Jeff Passon's Passon's original tweet, a tweet. So, I mean, things move quickly when they do happen. What uh, do you have as far as projections now for Lindor and Carlos Carrasco um, with New York versus Cleveland? Um, how much have they changed as a result of the deal and um, more favorable or uh, maybe uh, a little worse? You know, I haven't done a, a huge drastic changes to either Carrasco or Lindor. I mean, playing time should remain constant. Lindor gets hurt a little bit by the park, but he also gets helped a lot by in his counting stats with a much better lineup. The Mets already had a top three lineup last year. Now you add him to that. And it's, that's a really rocket ship lineup. They improved at catcher too with James McCann. I think, you know, top to bottom, this is an awesome lineup. So he, he should score more runs. He should knock more in. Uh, that should remain the same. What about for guys like uh, Rosario and Jimenez? Does their stock improve uh, going over to Cleveland where they can obviously get uh, immediate uh, playing time in that middle infield? Well, I think that's the big thing is both now can play. And, you know, neither are, you know, are really going to be uh, subject to that. They might hit better spots in the order too. Uh, that's the other thing. However, uh, it's not a great lineup. Neither is a sure thing. Jimenez doesn't hit for a whole lot of power. Rosario, he stopped running last year. That was one of the bigger mysteries of 2020 is only one stolen base attempt. I guess kind of the, one of the general lessons here is if you have a 270 on base percentage, you're not going to run that much. Yeah. Liam Hendricks uh, to the White Sox. That is a huge contract. It is a huge move. And you really could see his uh, save numbers just go through the roof right now with Chicago. Yeah, I mean, he, he goes to a worse park to pitch in, but he's on a really good team. Uh, again, I think he was already on a good team, you know, awesome team with the A's last year. In fact, the A's beat the White Sox. But uh, I think, you know, you know, the thing that I was – I was surprised, to be honest, because the average uh, annual value on his contract was higher than most rookie, uh, most relievers. And, I, you know, you look at baseball right now, they're systematically suppressing relief pitcher uh, salaries. I mean, you look at how, how the Indians acted with Brad Hand, for instance. 
Uh, you looked at how the Marlins let their closer go. I mean, you, you see that and you see a lot of these times just non-tendering, you know, guys that had good seasons and letting them go like that. Those are some of the big deals we've seen around baseball here in, in the last week or so since we've last spoken. But I've noticed that the website's been busy. You've got a lot of baseball content up right now. Yep. Uh, in, and in terms of some of the big stories, uh, Bernie Pleskov, offseason moves in the American League. You've got the bold predictions uh, from Jason Collette. Um, yep. and, and, and also the rounding third column, uh, talking about Michael Waka and, and just that's me things. there, by the way. Yeah. Oh, very nice. Very nice. Yeah. A little bit of different, uh, different off season activities to get people I guess, to, to whet your appetite a little bit. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, I'm trying to write more frequently, maybe write s- shorter articles, but try to, as soon as something hits my mind, instead of just tweeting about it, just write an article too. And so like Waka, I thought was interesting. It's like, Okay, normally that doesn't move the needle at all. A guy had a 660 ERA last year, but it's the Rays that are signing him. They do they what do they see? And do we appeal to the authority? Hey, it's the Rays. You know, maybe I should be interested. So you kind of dig deeper on him a little bit there, and then you start to evaluate everything else going on in the context of their organization. I hear you. That's, it's gonna be a lot of fun. Well, remember, for years, Waka was one of the better starting pitchers with the uh, Cardinals. The biggest issue with him was just staying healthy. When yep. he stayed healthy in St. Louis, he was good and. Tampa just always seems to find a way to, to, I don't want to call them reclamation projects, but you look what they did with guys like Charlie Morton and how Tyler Glasnow really kind of came uh, into his own with Tampa. They, they know what they're doing with, with pitchers. You, you have to take notice when they become a Ray. Yeah, that's right. And, you know, one thing is usage might be a little bit different. He might go shorter. They might have an opener in front of him. I'd love to see it like him get the Ryan Yarbrough treatment from a couple of years ago. Have them just go four innings, see what happens there. I think that might be a path to having him having some value, but we'll see. I mean, you know, they have to do a lot of make a lot of changes. Obviously, the Snell trade kind of changes things for them a little bit there. Uh, they they lose one guy at the top of the rotation, and Waka's not that. He's just going to be a guy that eats some innings for them. I'm hearing a rumor today uh, from a couple of different people that Masahiro Tanaka might be looking to sign with the Padres. They need another pitcher. I mean, it's, it's pretty crazy after getting Snell and Darvish. I mean, they're a deep team already. I mean, it, yes, it's untested depth. That That's the one thing you look at them. I, I think it's a sign, though, that they're not that confident about Denelson Lamette being healthy. And I'm really worried about him. You know, he got shut down at the for the playoffs there. It got hurt in his last start of the regular season. You look at his injury history. I am way below the pack on him. I'm, I'm not going to be try. I, I, won't, I, I predict I won't end up with him anywhere. Well, let's put it this way, though. Let's just say he's healthy and they use uh-huh. Tanaka as a fifth starter behind Paddock and the other three. And now all right. of a sudden you have one through five when healthy, um, a, a really good group. Let's assume Paddock re- rebounds to, to where he was two years ago and not last season. That's going to be a very difficult rotation to top, although some believe that top to bottom the Mets have one of the best rotations in the game, especially after they just added Carlos Carrasco to the group and we'll soon yeah. have Noah Syndergaard back when he comes and returns from Tommy John. Yeah. Dodgers might have something to say about that too. So we'll see, but uh, yeah, uh, I, 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 I'm interested in Marajan. I'm obviously I'm uh, Mackenzie Gore. See when he's going to get the call. I found it interesting. They didn't give him a shot last year, even though they, their, their healthy arms were dwindling. He was in the, uh, you know, alternate training camp site. But we never saw him. So uh, that'll be another decision that they'll have to make. They've got all these good live arms. It's just a question who's going to step in. Hey, I'm hoping that for Chihuahuas fans, we'll get a chance to see a little Mackenzie Gore before he yeah. breaks in in San Diego sometime during the summer. Yeah, I, I think that'd be the ideal path for them, too. I think they'd like to see him pitch, you know, two months worth, maybe even less. But yeah, hopefully, yeah, let's hopefully that the Chihuahua fans have anything to watch. You know, I, I think baseball is going to start a little late, and I have no idea when the minor leagues are going to start. Well, now, if they do start late, we, maybe we get less than 162 games. That's also going to be really interesting to see how many games they negotiate when it's all said and done. Right, and that's – unfortunately, we don't know that. We don't know whether it's going to be a National League DH again. Mm-hmm. Uh, there, it, it's made it extraordinarily difficult to kind of predict what's going to happen. It's already a diff- – you know, it's an, un, it's an uncertain science to begin with, and it's not even a science. It's more an art than a science. So uh, something else to watch for there too. Jeff Erickson back with us, rotowire.com, as we talk uh, and shift it over to the football right now in the NFL Divisional Playoffs. So, uh, Super Wild Card Weekend was fun. 
I thought the games were were, were pretty uh, entertaining, even the blowout game. I thought Chicago New Orleans was going to be the worst game, and and Chicago hung around defensively for a while and made that interesting. Although I wish I would have known about the Nickelodeon uh, telecast while the game was going on and not the day after, because I would have enjoyed a little uh, green slime in the end zone and SpongeBob uh, in between the goalposts. I wish I would have availed myself to that. I heard Nate Burleson did a great job with that too, but I like Nance and Romo. That was the thing. I didn't want to miss switch off that. I'll be honest. I thought that game was the snooze. Um, and the bears are just do that. I think that they're not an exciting team to watch. I've seen a few other, their games, their offense. I mean, the, the two minute drill at the end of the first half was telling that they didn't even try to have a two minute drill. They just ran the ball into the pile three times and just let the clock run out. And that, that's disappointing. Uh, it's a playoff game. You're an underdog. You're trailing by a little bit. Every possession should be important, but they didn't treat it as such. I'm looking forward to divisional weekend because I think from a fantasy standpoint, if you're playing in a playoff league and you have these players alive right now, like you do with your value rankings, I think all four games have a chance to be really good football games. Yeah, I agree with that. And, you know, I did do a playoff draft and it's not one. I had two different things. I do the NFFC one where we switch our lineups every week, although there's a multiplier for keeping a guy in. But and another one, it's just you you use them until they're done. And so you bankroll teams. So I had four Rams. I had acres. I have woods. I have the kickers and I have or the kicker and I have the defense. And that's huge. You know, that's something like, you know, when they get a win like that. OK, now I've got a leg up on the field because they were an underdog in that one there. That's nice. Meanwhile, as you look at your matchups this week, who are some of your favorite games you're looking at, especially from a fantasy standpoint? Well, I, I think you got to love the KC offense this week. You know, it was a nice story, Cleveland going into Pittsburgh and winning and, you know, ending a long playoff drought. I think they're going to get rolled this weekend. I, I, really? I really do. Um, but and, and I think it'll be an offensive game. I think Cleveland will move the ball. I think mm -hmm. they'll score, but I think Kansas City is really going to put up a big number here. So I'm looking forward to that. I'm looking forward to seeing the matchup between Devontae Adams versus Jalen Ramsey. Even if I want you know, Adams to do something, it's going to be fun to watch two uh, technicians at their craft. As good as the Rams were in Seattle against the Seahawks this past weekend and with the wild card win, do you believe that that defense can go into Lambeau when it's 20 degrees uh, on Saturday and, sh and actually shut down that Packers offense that's been so consistent all year long with the MVP of the league, um, Aaron Rodgers? You know, that's the question. And it's, can Aaron Donald play for that matter? I mean, I think that's, that's a big one there too. If they don't have Donald, then my uh, outlook on them is considerably dimmer. Uh, you know, they lose if, you know, and Donald, Donald's dealing with that, the rib cartilage issue there. That's a pain tolerance thing for the most part. But I mean, it's easy for us to say that and just say, Oh, just shoot them up. But you know, it's real pain. I mean, it, it, you know, but it, from what I've read, it's not like he's at risk of further damage. I, I hopefully I'm wrong. I, that's right. I, I'm not wrong about that, but you know, I, I think he'll play uh, Baltimore Buffalo is going to be interesting because you know, Lamar Jackson just said today, he's never played in snow. Well, looks like they're going to have some snow. So that could be fun. It's going to be a lot of fun actually. And you know, Baltimore um, again, just, got some revenge against Tennessee. There's no doubt about it. Yeah. And Cleveland exercising the ghosts uh, beating Pittsburgh. Look, I think Hunt and Chubb are going to be able to run the ball well against the Kansas City defense. I just don't know. Like you said, if it's a track meet, it's going to favor KC. Yeah, I think so too. Um, you know, the Browns might get their corners back this game after mi missing last week's game because of the COVID. So that's a big deal too. Uh, you know, we won't see Mahomes throw for 500 probably. But then again, game flow had kind of dictated that for Roethlisberger, especially after he threw four interceptions. I didn't expect Buffalo to struggle with Indianapolis like they did. And the Colts had a legitimate chance to win that football game, which tells you what that was like. Now that Buffalo got that game out of the way, do you think Baltimore gives them even more trouble this week? Or can the Bills get back to that swagger that they had for a good part of the second half of the season? You know, that's a good question. I, I think that, uh, you know, the Colts really moved the ball well, as good as any team did over the weekend. I think the Colts offense was really clicking. Uh, Baltimore's wasn't. And, you know, we saw both sides of the Lamar Jackson coin last week. You know, you saw that brilliant run, which nobody in the NFL can do it from that position, where he hit that second gear and it was just gone. Uh, but you saw a hideous interception where, you know, he got pressure, sure, but not too many quarterbacks in the NFL make that bad of a throw. 
even the two minute drill at the end of the first half was awful for Jackson. He, he made a really bad decision, really, you know, took a lot of time and then threw a sideways pass where they lost seven yards, lost a lot of time. You know, that's the sort of thing you can't afford uh, when you're trailing. So that'll be something to watch for too. Meanwhile, you mentioned uh, Adams and Ramsey at the big matchup. You've also got uh, in that Packers game, Aaron Jones right now ranked as your number two overall running back for a divisional weekend. Yeah, uh, I, I think you got to beat the Rams on the ground. I, I, I think you have to be able to run the ball effectively. And we saw even Seattle after the fact that they wish they would have ran the ball more. They fired their offensive coordinator after the game. Uh, they were running. They were averaging five yards a carry in the first half, and they kind of went away from that. You know, the Rams – by far orders of magnitude are the best at defending the pass and the, uh, you know, shutting down production from wide receivers. There's a standard deviation between them and the second place team. And there's a huge, you know, pretty big gap, you know, between them and everybody else. So I think you got to run the ball and it's, especially if it's cold, the weather helps. I don't think it's going to be that cold though. I thought I saw that it was going to be like 31, gotcha. which for green Bay standards, isn't that cold at all. Uh, Jeff Erickson, rotowire.com with us as we do it every week. Give me your thoughts on that uh, New Orleans Tampa Bay game and the two uh, Hall of Fame quarterbacks that are going to be clashing uh, this weekend. I loved Brady's tweet uh, mocking the history channel to, with the two uh, quarterbacks there. I thought that was clever. But um, I think that the Saints are, you know, both teams need to be able to throw the ball because both teams are excellent at stopping the run. Uh, the, the Bucks allowed 100 yard rusher all year. Uh, and that, that wasn't in the matchup between these two teams. Uh, the last time out, the Saints dominated in Tampa. Uh, I don't think we have to worry about Tom Brady's bedtime in this game, at least. So there's that. Won't be a night game. But uh, I, I do think that, you know, the, the Bucks are at another level than they were in their, prior to their previous matchup. Yet I still like the Saints side better. I think they're getting healthier and healthier. They get Michael Thomas back for this one, full, fully functioning Michael Thomas. I, I like the the Saints by about five or six points in this one. And that would be what the first time in his career that Tom Brady uh, would be beaten by the same team three times in one season, right? Yeah, it, it's rare because well, first of all, they you know you only typically get that chance you only get that chance in a divisional matchup, uh, and they ruled the roost in the AFC East for so long, so you could see why he'd never been beaten. But and typically, I think in, in matchups in the last I don't know the the, the time span. But there's been 21 games between uh, two teams where one team is two and zero, and they go for the third, and they're they're 14 and seven. So the 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 favorite usually wins on these ones two thirds of the time. So that's the re other reason why I like the Saints a little bit better. Let's talk about some stories that are up right now uh, at RotoWire.com. I saw there's a dynasty watch uh, for football fans, which is fun because you're talking about the top 20 rookie running backs that are going to be coming out uh, of college this year and already starting to rank them for dynasty. But you've got other great articles, uh, some of the current ones, your value meter. What would you like to profile for us this week, Jeff? Well, the dynasty watch is really good because those of you who are out, out now but you're in dynasty leagues, well, it's time to kind of get into it here a little bit. Uh, and it's interesting to, to get uh, my colleague Mario Puig's take on that. So, you know, I, I'm in one dynasty league and I've already gotten trade offers. So it's always kind of good to start looking. At, I mean, the national championship game on Monday kind of like, show, you know, shown a light on Devontae Smith and how much, how good he is. But are those skills going to translate at the NFL level? He's not a big guy. But then again, we've seen lately, it's not always like just huge size and speed that rules the roost. You need to have those route running skills. And he certainly has that. He could be the next Devontae Adams. Good job as always, Jeff. Check it out, rotowire.com. You can get a free 10-day trial subscription without even putting down a credit card. It's so easy. All you got to do is go rotowire.com slash free, and you're in, and you get a chance to experience everything we're talking about right now and more. So look forward to it next week, Jeff. Thanks as always for the time. You bet. Thanks, Steve.